Uh, we start with the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and although the title is Current Events, we cannot just jump straight into 2007 without having just a little bit of understanding about what happened. Because if I had asked you what do you know about this place, and you're the average Americans, you don't do any research in depth, you would have told me what you hear in the news media today, yesterday, but the problem is that the media never has the time to take the time to go in depth to explain what was going on, who are these people over there, what is the West Bank? So before we actually try to describe what happens, just some basic information to understand what is the nature of the conflict, and then we'll zoom in and we'll take those slices and pieces one after the other to give you what I hope will be a decent overview of what happens in Israel today, but without touching just a bit on the past, it's not going to make any sense whatsoever. So I do want to start, as always, with a map, and you do know that maps are a great way to start any sort of presentation. Well, here's the map of the Middle East. And this map shows you the Middle East until the First World War, around 1921, 1922. And if you look at the map, you don't see a country called Syria. You don't see a country called Iraq. You don't see Saudi Arabia, no Israel, no Lebanon, no Yemen, no Kuwait. Am I suggesting that none of these countries existed only 80 years ago? Well, this is exactly it. Until 80 years ago, there were no countries in the Middle East. There were no nations in the Middle East, let alone national aspirations. It was all part of the Ottoman Empire, and for your understanding, the whole idea of Arab nations is strange to Islam, because Islam's ambition is to have one nation under one religious ruler called a caliph, and when the Muslim world was kind of divided to different national entities, this is considered to be among the clerics as a big violation of the spirit of Islam. And therefore, to speak about Muslim nations, it's almost an oxymoron from a Muslim religious perspective. And therefore, the whole idea of having countries of Muslim nature was only born not because they wanted it, but because this was the interest of the superpowers who won the First World War. And therefore, until about 80 years ago, these countries did not exist. That means if you had approached a man in the streets of Baghdad, which is over there, no, back please, the streets of Baghdad over there and ask him, sir, you live in a place called Baghdad, uh, what is your nationality? He will just stare at you. He did not know that he has a nationality. He would have told you that he is a Muslim, indicating his religion, and he will tell you that he is a resident of the Ottoman Empire, indicating the place that he lives, but this would be it. If you would say, are you not an Iraqi by your nationality? You just told him something amazing that he has a nationality. Muslims were not thinking in such terms not even 50 years ago. If you had stopped an Arab in Jerusalem, which is over there, asking the same question, he would have told you that he's an Arab, most likely a Muslim, but he could have said Christian as well. Arab is indicating not even a race, a culture, a way of life. So you can be a Muslim Arab or a Christian Arab, and by the way, most Muslims around the world are not Arabs. Like in India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, many other places. So many people make the connection, which is not necessarily true between Arabs and Muslims. So the man in Jerusalem would have told you that he is an Arab, most likely Muslim, and you will tell him you live in a place that is known historically as Palestine. Are you not a Palestinian by your nationality? He didn't know that he has a nationality. He lived in a province that was called Palestine that was part of the Ottoman Empire. And therefore, not that long ago, there was no national conflict because there were no nations in the Middle East. And this is a very important factor to remember. Now, we do not have the time to take it step by step from the First World War. But without understanding that, something will be missing in your comprehension. Because too many people say that this conflict goes back for centuries upon centuries. This is not the case. National conflicts in the Middle East only started 50, 60 years ago simply because there were no nations beforehand. These nations were created not by a Muslim desire, but by the interest of the Christian superpowers that won the First World War. So until 1922, that would be the situation. And here's the Middle East today. All of these countries that you know so well today, none of them existed. Turkey was the Ottoman Empire, and that was it. All the others were part of the Ottoman Empire. To take it another step further, just to set the scene, what are we talking about? Well, here's the mighty state of Israel in little America. In fact, you do see that we speak about a very uh, small area. And you see the data over there, how much bigger is the U.S. than the state of Israel. Israel is a little bit smaller than the great state of New Jersey, 8,000 square miles. 
Well, this map will give you an idea, but this map is not presenting any challenge. The next one does, because that's Israel in a very tough neighborhood called the Middle East. Now you tell me, just look at the map, what are the odds of a country to survive in such a hostile neighborhood? Well, although we are a secular society, we do understand that if it was not for God's plan and God standing with us, this would not be possible. And therefore, you begin to understand what Israel has to deal with. This region has more than 300 million Arabs in it. Most of them are Muslims. And you do see that Israel is a very painful injection, so to speak, in the very heart of Islam. But make no mistakes. It's not because of us being there that there is an issue today, which is a global one. And how many people you heard say that if there was no state of Israel, there was no problem? That is absolutely nonsense. But as long as the technology was limited, they could only go after the entity that represented the West, and that was us. Now they do have the technology, they won't hesitate to carry the war any corner of the world. And unfortunately, that's what happens, and that's what we saw in some places already. So we are still in the times of setting the scene, and we need to start somewhere, and therefore, just to speak about a very important event that will clarify some things that all of you are familiar, or you think that you are familiar with. With all the conflict in the area, Jews and Arabs and the British Mandate, etc., it came to a climax after the Second World War. This is the area that the world was calling Palestine, if you wish, and so the British Empire. It had the River Jordan on the eastern side. This is the Hashemite Kingdom of Transjordan, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon. All that, all that happened in the few decades that I just skipped in order to get to this map and to 1947. The Second World War was over. Great Britain won the war, but they decided to leave Palestine because they lost the empire, and there were two people fighting over the land, the Jews and the local Arabs. And Great Britain, not to leave a totally chaos behind, was asking the UN that was born about a year earlier, 1945, to come, or two years earlier, to come and try to solve the problem between the two people that fighting over the land. The UN sent a party over, 11 members, and this was in 1947, February, and after a few months of meeting with leaders from both sides, Jews and Arabs alike, they decided that partition would be the preferred solution. That means we are going to take the small piece of land, divide it into two. There will be a Jewish state, as you see the arrows and the two colors, and there will be an Arab state. And according to their idea, the city of Jerusalem will not be the capital of any of these new entities. It will be an international city. That was the plan. One party accepted it, and this was the Jewish side. Keep in mind, we speak about a few years after the Holocaust. Six million Jews have perished. Anything that the world had offered to be a safe place for the Jews to go to was accepted. The locals, the Arabs, said, no way. This is Muslim holy territory. The Jews have no rights on it. And therefore, when the British are leaving, if the Jews will dare to proclaim their independent state, it's a full-scale war. Now, I'm not biased, at least not yet. I'm telling you the facts, and these are very easy to check. And therefore, the turning point which led to a problem, although if both parties had accepted the partition plan, maybe there was no problem today. So the most basic resolution made by the UN was rejected by one side, which is the main reason for the conflict until this very day. So this was the plan, the partition plan, and keep in mind that it speaks about two countries, not just one. One for the Jews, one for the Arabs. As the British mandate terminated, and that was in the 14th of May, 1948, which happened to be a Friday, the Arab armies invaded Israel. That means it wasn't just an issue between the local Palestinians and the Jews, but once the British were out, the armies of Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt invaded Israel in order to destroy the Jewish state. That's what we call the War of Independence. When this war ended, something amazing happened. One state was born, we prevailed, the state of Israel. What about the other one? Keep in mind that the UN spoke about two countries. If I'd ask you why the Palestinians never had an independent state, I think that I know your answer, but you're wrong. You would have told me that you conquered their country, and therefore, there was no Palestinian independent state, right? Well, not so. You see, the Jordanians came seemingly to help. You see the green that bulges into the yellow. This was area allocated to the Palestinians as homeland. Jordan came to back them up, but after the war was over, and the Palestinians asked the Jordanian army to pull out so they can have their country, King Abdullah I of Jordan said, no, I like it here. It's a good lush land. I'm staying. 
1950, this area was officially annexed to the Kingdom of Jordan. By the way, no country in the world accepted this annexation, except for Britain and Pakistan for who knows what reasons. And that's what we call the West Bank. The West Bank, therefore, is the area west of the River Jordan, 2,600 square miles, not such a big area, population of 2 million people today, is the area that was allocated to the Palestinians as homeland, but was taken by Jordan. The same thing happened on the southern front. The Egyptians came seemingly to help, and they sent their troops into the area of Gaza, and this is the area of Gaza Strip. And after the war was over, the Palestinians were asking the Egyptians to pull back. After all, it was supposed to be their country allocated to them by the UN. And Egypt said, oh no, I'm staying. The Egyptians never officially annexed the Gaza Strip. That means that the Palestinian state was not born, not because of Israel. The Palestinian state was not born because the land that was allocated to them was taken by the Jordanians and by the Egyptians. In other words, the Palestinian nation if there was one in 1948, the hopes to be independent were in vain. But Israel should not be accused for the outcomes of the war. Folks, that's history, right? Without any commentaries and without any interpretations, these are the facts. That's what happened. And now we need to take it one step forward to explain 1967. There was a war between Israel and its neighboring countries, and not for the first time. And during this war, a lot of land was conquered. We took the West Bank, obviously, by the way, let's call it by the biblical name Judea and Samaria, the very heartland of biblical Israel. That's what politically is known as the West Bank, but we should call it Judea and Samaria. And then the Golan Heights, of course, and all the country, all the area was now in Israeli hands. And we made a major mistake in 1967. We were so taken by the amazing victory, and it was an amazing victory, that we didn't notice something very important. The land that we now liberated, some would say conquered, was the very same land that was allocated to the Palestinians only 19 years earlier, but they never saw their country. It was taken by Jordan. Suddenly, another country controls the area. That's the state of Israel, a democracy. What a great change. Because in Jordan, if you want to fight for your legitimate rights as a nation, you end up with a bullet in your head. That's the tolerance of Arab dictatorships. But in Israel... You can do basically whatever you want. We are a democracy. So under our very noses, something happened that we were too, I would say, careless to notice. We were so occupied by the great victory that we did not notice that these people that live in this area might want their national rights once again. And now they can speak openly about that because in Israel, that's how the system works. Not in Jordan and not in Egypt. And back there in 1967, we simply did not pay any attention to that. So we do have an issue, and now we know at least what's the area on the table. What we speak about is the West Bank and the area of Gaza. 1979, Israel gave Sinai back to the Egyptians, and we were begging them on our knees to take Gaza with them. After all, it was part of Egypt. The Egyptians decided not to. Nobody wants Gaza. And only 1988, and this was quite amazing, King Hussein of Jordan said that what his grandfather was annexing in 1950, he doesn't have any demands anymore. It was never his territory, acknowledging the fact of the illegitimate annexation of the West Bank. They can have it. Until 1988, many Arab countries did not believe that the Palestinians are a nation and have the right for an independent state. Because this was Jordanian territory, basically, and they did not give their consent. 1988. It's only, what, 20 years ago, even less. We just don't really know the facts. So since 1988, we know what's on the negotiation table. Two pieces of land. The West Bank on one side, Judea and Samaria, the area of Gaza. That's the whole story. Now, something had to happen in order to start a process. A starter was needed. And this start that took place in 1993, and we call that today the Oslo Accords. And there we are going into the current events. Well, in 1992, elections in Israel, a new prime minister, some secret negotiations, exchange of letters between the Israeli prime minister and the Palestinian chairman of the Palestinian or the, uh, the PLO, Yasser Arafat. That means that before we can start to talk to each other, we need to have a mutual recognition each in other's existence and right for that, etc. Just if you read that in a few minutes. So once the leaders exchanged the letters and each one made a commitment 
that was a precondition to start the open negotiations. Once this was accomplished, the parties are now going to meet in Washington, obviously, and to try to make some, to promote the thing if only possible. So what happened was the following. We wake up one morning to see this amazing handshake. Even now, it's kind of amazing to see that of Yasser Arafat and Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. And that started the open negotiations. And a declaration of principles was signed. And this was in September of 1993 here in Washington. And this was supposed to be the beginning of a great partnership. You see, the idea was this. We have to put the past behind. We need to just forget about the hostilities. We need to work together for the best interests of our people because we had enough of bloodshed. And we are willing to work hard to accomplish that. That was the idea. It is true that there was a lot of opposition to the whole peace process, so to speak, in Israel as well as in the Palestinian side. But for many people, most people, it looked like it's going to work. If you had asked me 14, 15 years ago, and I'm the most average Israeli, what do I think? I would have told you. With all the ups and downs, it's coming. Peace is around the corner. You know why? Because it's good. It's good for everybody. If we can only reason, we can only try to talk to each other, it can work. And then we made a second big mistake. We thought that when we're making an offer to the Palestinians, and we talk to their leader, yes, Arafat, we are talking to a Palestinian nationalist, a politician, because he wants to keep the debate and the argument and the fight on a political level. We did not realize that something happened in the Palestinian society, Arafat included. They took it to the religious track. I mean, Arafat was a communist, by the way. Suddenly, you see him in mosques, making statements of religious nature. That was unheard. And we simply ignored it. You see, because when it comes to this level of the religions, it's a dead end. If you speak about God, you cannot negotiate in his behalf. He promised the land to the Jews. They say it's a promise to the Muslims. It's not in our hands anymore. Now the God's supposed to kind of solve the problem. You see, once you take it to this level, it is indeed a dead end. And therefore, we tried very hard to keep it on the lower national level, because on that level, you shake hands, you talk some common sense, you can find a solution. We did not notice that this whole thing is shifting quite quickly to the religious track. It was always about that, by the way, make no mistakes. But very cleverly, politicians covered up the whole religious issue because it was much easier to speak about politics. So politicians are now going to try to cut a deal. And what the Oslo Accords are saying basically is very simple, land for peace. We are going to give the Palestinians some land and what we can get in return is peace, basically. That was the only thing they could give us. It doesn't say an independent state. It speaks about an autonomy. It doesn't even say how much land of what we thought they want, meaning Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. It doesn't say how much land they're going to get in the end of the process. It speaks about an autonomy. It speaks about fighting terror together. Let's make a common issue out of it because it's good for you as well to get rid of those armed militias on your side. What they also wanted, of course, is to return the refugees, but that would be, of course, impossible from Israel's side. And then we said that we are going to end the violence, and this is going to reflect also on Israel and its neighboring countries. Once the Palestinian issue is solved, that will be the breakthrough to have peace in the entire Middle East. That was the consensus between Israel, the Palestinians, and also the Arab countries. Pay attention that the tough issues are not really mentioned. Jerusalem, final borders, refugees, how much land they're going to get, it's not there. It's not there because of one reason. The gap was so unbridgeable that if you bring in the tough issues, you're going nowhere. The idea was, let's agree upon what we can agree upon. Let's give it a try. And after five years of living in peace, we will realize that peace is great then we'll bring in the tough issues, but by then it will be easy. Because peace is great, right? We're wrong. That was the mindset. That was the mindset between those leaders trying to work out some sort of a solution. And since we knew that we are going to have a lot of ups and downs, we did say that we'll do what partners do. We're going to sit at the table on a cup of coffee. We're going to solve the issues. We're going to talk. We are partners. We have a common goal. We are going to change the history of the Middle East 
it looked like a great idea and achievable only 14, 15 years ago. So two leaders that signed an agreement that they go back home to try to sell the new product to the people. It's Huck Rabin is addressing the Israelis on radio, on TV, and his message was not an easy one, but people were willing to take the chance. There was a majority in Israel, Israel is a democracy, the government cannot work against the people's will. Arafat addressed his people in a different way, and he was in Tunisia, and he did it on radio, in Arabic. It's very important to listen to the messages in Arabic and not in any other language. And the message was, we fooled the Jews, we will not rest until the last Jew is in the ocean and the banners of Islam are waved on the walls of Jerusalem. Now you should ask me a question, what are you, deaf? Can't you hear? Can't you speak Arabic? How come you heard the message and you didn't stop the whole thing immediately? Well, because in Israel, since there was a lot of opposition on both sides, in the Israeli side as well, we thought that he's talking to the opposition. He tries to draw them to his side. It doesn't mean that. He was a bitter enemy, but he's an honest man. We shook hands over something. We're going to work together. It's going to work. And therefore, although we heard what was going on, we decided to ignore that because we thought it's kind of a political trick that he's playing on his opposition. But since he shook our hands, it's going to work. So now we know the two parties came to the table to try to implement something they didn't have a chance to begin with. And why not? Well, number one, because the expectations were so high. We were hoping that overnight terror is gone. They were hoping that overnight the standard of living will be elevated to the same level of the West maybe. None of that happened. It was impossible to accomplish what the Oslo Accords were actually saying. And of course, the main issues were not really dealt with. We kind of waited to see refugees and borders and therefore many of the Palestinians and the Israelis. So listen, we need to see where this is going to. We cannot just agree upon something so vague because it might go to different directions. But the main problem was, of course, that there was absolutely no, no willingness, so to speak, from the Palestinian side to do the only thing they could do to please Israel. And that's to try to suppress their own terror groups like Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Popular Front, and all those gangs and militias. And once something happened in Israel, for example, a bomb in a cafeteria, that was before people started blowing themselves up with bombs. And we have quite good intelligence. And we knew who was the man that set a bomb. And we called up our new partner, Arafat, and told him, listen, you need to go and arrest him because they got some land by then. His answer was usually, I don't want to do that. It will start a civil war. I can't. They are too strong. They're getting the weapons from Saudi Arabia, not Iran yet. I'm weak. I need some help. You know what we did? We helped. We gave him rifles. We gave him weapons. Because back then we were partners and he needed help. Today those weapons are used against us. But 1993, 4, 5, it looked like the right thing to do. So the minimum that we were hoping that they are going to do, were well, not even that. That means we have now a regime, the PA, all right, that's how I'm going to call it, the Palestinian Autonomy, that they appear as honest politicians around the world. All the doors were open for Arafat, and he exploited it to the maximum, going to speak for the Palestinian cause. He just did his job. But in the very same time, he was encouraging Hamas and Islamic Jihad to carry on with the terror, because by then the pressure on Israel would be so hard, we can accomplish more. So even if we wanted him to do the basic thing to confront those, there was no any kind of willingness to do that. It was good for him because these guys are intensifying the pressure on the political field. I can really reap a lot of good fruits here because of the pressure. And I can always say, I don't control them. What can I do? Today, by the way, these guys are so strong and so big, even bigger than Arafat's group, and he died a few years ago. He created a monster that nobody can control anymore. But that was the idea. It was their choice. And of course, the other things was the, well, he asked them, of course, to collect the illegal weapons, but we knew from the very beginning it's not going to work. By the way, the Palestinian excuse was always that Israel is not keeping each side of the agreement, obviously. For example, the settlements. I'm telling you once again, the Oslo Accords are mentioning absolutely nothing about the right of Israel to build communities in the territories. Absolutely nothing. The Oslo Accords are saying nothing about how much land they're going to get. But that was the excuse all the time. If we talk about peace, and Israel keeps building in the territories that we believe should be ours, 
no territories will be left to negotiate upon. And therefore, it's their fault. That was the Palestinians' reason. But once again, if you go by the letter of the law, the Oslo Accords are mentioning absolutely nothing about settlements, about the future of the settlements, or about the right of Israel to build them. And since it wasn't really working, and just have a look at the map, which is so confusing. Here's the map. This is the West Bank, or Judea and Samaria, and this is Gaza. We gave the Palestinians the big cities first. We don't want to rule over those big cities. They could have it, and it was a test case to show the world, themselves, and us how they can run their own businesses. Bethlehem, Hebron, Jericho, Ramallah, Shechem, Tulkarem, Jenin, Kalkilia, all those are in Palestinian hands now. And then we said, reciprocity. If you're going to make some steps forward and keep your part of the agreement, you'll get some more land. But since you're not showing any gesture, any goodwill, absolutely nothing, totally incompetent, we're not giving land anymore. If this land that we gave to the Palestinians is going to be a safe haven for terrorists to flee to and to take shelter because we respected the agreement and we did not pursue them into their territories, so what's the point? In other words, it took us a few years to understand that this is going nowhere. Arafat came to Gaza in July 1st of 1994, and that's where officially the Palestinian autonomy was found or established. When Arafat came to Gaza, he brought with them a lot of people from the Palestinian circles who never lived in the territories. They came with him from Northern Africa, from Arab countries, and they took over all the power in the new Palestinian administration. Now think about the frustration of the locals. Nobody of the local Palestinians, those that suffered under Israeli occupation, was part of the new regime. The discontent in the Palestinian side was growing to such an extent it almost exploded. So the world is giving money to see the success of the process. This money, instead of elevating the Palestinian way of life to build schools and roads and sewage and whatever they need, basically, most of it was going to the pockets of these people and to build a militia that were three times in the number that the Oslo Accord are saying. The Oslo Accord are saying 12,000 police officers in Arafat peacekeeping force. Now he has 40,000 on the payroll. So the money that was dedicated to create better life was never really made it to the average Palestinian. No wonder why the discontent was growing. 85% of unemployment in Gaza, do you understand that? 85%. The border to Israel was still open. You want to come and work in Israel? Please, by all means, go and provide for the family. We do not want to see a humanitarian catastrophe in the other side. But when you have some discontent and people are unhappy, the regime only has one choice and one choice only. It's not our fault. The problem is Israel. That means as long as we are in the bitter struggle, let's forget about corruptions and all these stupid issues. The time will come to deal with that. Now we have to be united because there is an enemy. And we still thought that we have friends on the other side. We still want to talk and negotiate. And since it wasn't working, we tried to orchestrate a new plan. Let's just go through the whole slide, please, because I covered that already. As you can tell, I'm not very disciplined in following the slide. Well, since it wasn't really working, we decided to make another plan. And this plan was based on what we thought are the demands of the Palestinians. We said, listen, since they want an Israeli withdrawal from the territories, that's one thing that we'll consider. We will also consider in the new plan that we are making the right of return to refugees. We cannot really accept that fully because if those refugees who fled during the war come back to the territory, we will be outnumbered overnight, the end of Israel. We can help with money. We can do whatever necessary. They're not coming back home. And by the way, when the Second World War ended, there were tens of millions of refugees around Europe. You don't hear a problem today. Each one finds a home and has a life. These guys are still refugees because the Arab world would always foil any plan that the world was offering to resettle them. They were using them cynically as human tools, always as an upfront against Israel. It's a real tragedy. We speak about a third generation of refugees that live in horrible conditions, not because there's no money out there to solve the problem. Lots of money, because the Arab regimes do not want to see the solution. They are pleased with the situation. That's the main excuse. Refugees, they need to go home. Well, they're not going home. The other thing that we thought that might please them is to release prisoners, and there were many of them in the Israeli jails. And of course, East Jerusalem, they wanted it as capital. Well. 
will consider it. The two leaders are meeting once again in Washington. We only live about a mile away from each other. When we want to meet, we go to Washington. Barack from the Israeli side, the new Prime Minister, Arafat, and Israel presents the plan. Well, if you look at the plan, this is the most generous plan that any Israeli regime ever is going to make. It cannot be more generous than that. We said, listen, we are going to offer you 93% of what we thought you want, the territories. And we are going to compensate for the missing 7% from area, from Israel proper, by the Gaza Strip. A Jewish prime minister, for goodness sake, is willing to offer East Jerusalem to the Palestinians. And this is so generous that we were positive it would not be rejected. That's the plan. Take it. We were so surprised unpleasantly when the answer was, not enough. And that was a great wake-up call. Not enough? That means that when we started seven years earlier, you didn't know how much land you're going to get. And now we offer 100% of the land. We offer Jerusalem as capital, East Jerusalem, including Temple Mount. And that's not enough. But what is enough? And suddenly we understood. It was never about two countries living peacefully side by side. It was about them replacing us. And if that's the case, it's not going to happen. And since the summit had failed, every failure of such summits in the Middle East is followed by a wave of terror. That's what happened. Right after that, the, what we call the Second Intifada. Well, this is an important statement to read because it tells you the bottom line. And I'm not going to go over all the atrocities and the bombs and Israel retaliation. It's not that important. We need to understand the principles here. And since nothing was working, the world decided to be more involved, and America is moving in. Keep in mind that the first years of the first Bush administration, America was not involved deeply in the Middle East because the memories of Clinton's failure to try to get the parties together was still fresh in the administration's mind. We don't really want to deal with it unless we have to. And unfortunately, 9-11 forced America also to be deeply involved. And then President Bush is presenting the plan, which is known until today, and this is the official plan, by the way, on the table even today, the roadmap for peace in the Middle East. We were very unpleasantly surprised because America's position until this statement was made was that the problems in the Middle East between Israel and Palestinians are a local problem. You deal with the problem, you negotiate, whatever you agree upon, you have a blessing. We are going to support you, we are going to provide everything you need, but you cut a deal, and whatever you agree upon, America will back it up. Now the new statement was that since you've proven that you cannot get a loan well, we are going to dictate a solution. And when he said that it was always America's dream to see two states, no, it was not, until he said it loud and clear. By the way, not a bad idea. Maybe we needed somebody from the outside to give us a push. And very quickly, Israel said, sure, we'll take it. And so did the Palestinians. But Israel only said it because of one reason, not because it's good for Israel, because the whole plan had a precondition, which was that unless the Palestinians stop terror totally, this is not going into effect. And since the Palestinians were not capable or not willing to stop terror, we knew this is not going to work. And therefore, we said, Amen. The Palestinians said, Amen. And that's the plan on the table, but nobody's working toward this direction because they could not keep the most basic thing, stop the terror. Even if they want to now, they can. It's too late. But the plan on the table is still the roadmap for peace. And meanwhile, Israel was, you know, doing something on the ground to try to protect lives. We started building a fence, all right? I know that sometimes in CNN you hear about a wall. Remember the wall, the wall, the wall? Well, the wall is a Pink Floyd album from the 80s. It's a fence, 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 fence. But it sounds more dramatic when you speak about the wall. By the way, 5% of the fence is indeed a concrete wall. If you come to Jerusalem, you see that part of the city is already divided. Because whenever or wherever the Palestinian homes are close to the Israeli side. We don't want them to shoot through the fence on Israelis, Israeli vehicles. There is a concrete wall. But 95% is a fence, and it's very effective. It's working very well. Terror is down about 99% because we made a very simple message. If you come closer to the fence, we'll shoot you. That means if you want to come and work, go to the checkpoints. We are going to check your bags. We're going to make sure that you don't come in to take lives, but to support lives on your side. We don't want them to starve to death. 
But this was the way that we decided to protect our people. There was a fence between California and Mexico. And when was the last Mexican terrorist crossing over from the other side? So we do live in a big gated community, so to speak, like many of you, I'm sure. Now, why do you live in a gated community? Well, because you want to keep the bad guys out, maybe. Well, the same idea. And the world was unwilling to understand. The world was upset because part of the path of the fence was not going on the international border. We actually annexed some territory, and the fence was going on top of Palestinian territory. But we said many times, this is not a border. It's a security fence. If we know for sure the terror is gone, the fence is gone a day later. And it's working very well. Didn't complete yet, and if you want to know the reason why the fence is not completed, because we gave the right to every Palestinian that believed that the fence is violating his rights to appeal to the Supreme Court. And they did, by their hundreds. Not because it's a real violation, but if you want to stop the work, that's what you do. And since they don't have the money to do that, international human rights activists are moving in, paying the fee to the Supreme Court, and as long as the issue is on their tables, you can't work. And they deal with the issues one by one. We want to do things so right that nobody in the world will have any complaints against the oppressive Israeli administration. So we gave them the right to do that. In about a few months, the last issue will be dealt with, and then the fence will be completed. And as long as terror is coming from the other side, the fence stays. It won't stop rockets, as we see in the Gaza area. But it's very efficient to stop people. So the security fence was the only thing that we could do in order to protect some of our side. And then Arafat died, and that was in November 11th of 2004, if I recall correctly, and he left the total chaos behind. I mean, the whole idea of the administration on the other side was that, and the man, as somebody described him, actually from his side, that he was a leader with a national vision and a mentality of a gang leader. And in a way, maybe this was the case. He left behind a total chaos because all the gang leaders in the territories were answering directly to Arafat. Once he was gone, nobody could replace him. It was a total chaos, still is, a total chaos. So when Arafat was gone, we knew that it's not going to be followed by something good. And meanwhile, Israel initiated another step that we didn't have to. And many friends of Israel in America had a hard time to understand why Israel is willing to give up the whole Gaza area and to destroy totally the Zionist vision of, you know, planting the trees over there and the greenhouses and just reviving the land. Well, because of two main reasons, and I'm not sure that you like them, but I'll tell you anyhow. The first one was, and we need to be a little practical about that, the Gaza area, which is over there, had 18 Jewish communities in it. The world calls them settlements, communities, small pockets, surrounded by 1.4 million Palestinians. But the Palestinian population was growing so fast ever since 1967 that what used to be isolated Jewish communities were now literally surrounded by the Palestinian refugee camps, homes, communities, etc. It was impossible to guarantee their safety anymore. When a car of a family was going from one community to the other, it had to be escorted by a tank, sometimes by a helicopter. Didn't make any sense. Eighteen communities, each one had an elite infantry brigade guarding 40, 50 families. We don't have that amount of people to protect the settlers. We need to say for their, or to commend them, they never asked for protection. They were there because of a very, I would say, zealous motivation to stay but it's a state's responsibility to protect its people. And since we could not guarantee that anymore, that was one reason. When little Jimmy wanted to go to see his friend, well, Israel, little Shloimele, wanted to go to visit his friend, even something so, so simple, he would not leave the comfort zone of the community before the army jeep was there or the tank was there just to take him half a mile away to the next community. It was absolutely crazy. From a military perspective, well, it's much easier to protect the line, all right, than to protect these pockets surrounded by so many Palestinians. But it was a political reason as well. If the world was still debating who wants peace, and the world was pressing on Israel very hard, saying, listen, you have to make some concessions. If you do, the Palestinians will agree, and maybe it will be the breakthrough. All right, we are going to show the world, and we need now the Palestinians to deliver from their side. That means Israel was leaving the Gaza Strip totally, hoping, although we knew it's not going to happen that this gesture, so to speak, will be so appreciated 
It will bring the people together once again. The Palestinians will start fighting their own terror groups because one party means business. And you know what? Ever since, Israel is under no pressure politically. How uncomfortable. We know exactly how to function under pressure. Suddenly, no pressure. We don't know what to do. The world is not demanding from Israel absolutely nothing anymore. Absolutely nothing. It doesn't change the situation on the ground. But politically, the pressure now is on the Palestinians. Israel did more than it should do. Now you show us how much you want peace and what are you willing to do for peace. And the answer is basically nothing. Because by now, even if they want to, they cannot. It's a total chaos in the territories. Nobody controls what's going on. The aftermath was quite disappointing, as you understand. Since we are not in Gaza anymore, they can build a terror state, if you wish, and that's what happens, and start launching small rockets on Israeli territories. Very inefficient, very small. The range is very short, but it's a constant reminder that something is coming at you from the other side. And when do they do that, by the way, launching the rockets? Every day, 7.45 in the morning. What happens 7.45? The kids go to school. So they don't even hide their intention what kind of casualties they would like to see on the Israeli side. It happens on a daily basis. Think about somebody shooting rockets from Tijuana to San Diego. What would America do? Right? And we don't. Our retaliation is minor. Because whatever we do, it will cause lots of damage and innocent casualties on their side. We don't want to do that. And here's a classical dilemma. How to go after those terrorists without causing a humanitarian problem. We don't have the answer yet. And by the way, the same problems in Iraq. So we are facing the same kind of challenges. And since there is total chaos over there, chaos usually is the advantage is taken by people that prosper in chaos. Al-Qaeda, for example, Iran is moving in. Everybody enjoys chaos. Terror enjoys chaos. You need to understand that. Because they are building their power base in the territories now. And it's interesting because Hamas, who are now the leaders, are Sunnis. Iran are Shiites. And these two groups within Islam hate each other. They would only gather around one issue, and that's a hatred to Israel and to America. So they're willing to cooperate in order to do that. So putting out from the Gaza area had some benefits, but it had one major problem. The major problem was that the land borders of Gaza are not controlled by Israel. In fact, we are controlling the areas here, the sea and the airspace. But there is one narrow road over there that goes from Gaza into Egypt. This is the Egyptian responsibility to monitor what goes into Gaza from Egypt. The Egyptians don't care. And therefore, every day as we speak, we speak about tons of explosives and tons of weapons and people that are going into Gaza under the noses of the Egyptians, and Egypt has an interest to intensify the instability in the region, and nobody controls what's going on. So in front of our very eyes, these guys are accumulating weapons, and these are not going to be presented in the museum. They're going to use them sooner or later. And the question is, why aren't we doing something to stop that? Well, because we have peace with Egypt. So we cannot say openly that Egypt is not performing well, although that's what happens. We don't want to have a crisis with the Egyptians. But it's so easy to bring those weapons in. Look at the map. A truck can start going from Iran through southern Iraq, and now the British are out, by the way, from the area of Basra, into Saudi Arabia, cross the Red Sea into Sinai, all the way to the Gaza area. Nobody will stop it. Absolutely nobody. Nobody has an interest to stop it. Sinai, by the way, this is the new terrorist haven. It's Egyptian territory. The Egyptians don't really care about what's going on. When we pulled out from Sinai as a result of the peace accord, we left behind millions of landmines. Explosives. You can make bombs out of those. And since the Egyptian army is not there, the local Bedouins do that, and they sell it for good money to anybody who wants. And who wants them? Well, the guys here in the Gaza Strip. Look how small this place is. And still, such a major problem. Israel has a big dilemma. And this dilemma was represented, so to speak, in the last election campaign in my country, which was in March of 2006. What you will read over there in a few minutes no longer stands. Because the Lebanese war, we speak about it in the next session, changed basically the whole mindset in the country. But the Israeli people had spoken, and they voted for a party that had a plan. The plan was to pull out from more territories, 
and give it to anybody who wants them, not for negotiations. It will be a unilateral decision. And you must ask me, what are you crazy? Once again, to repeat the same mistake, what's the point? Well, here's the point. Israel has a choice. The choice is to have a greater Israel, which means to annex Judea, Samaria, go and conquer Gaza. We are capable of doing that. It's not a military problem. If we do that and we annex the whole area and we give rights to the people that live there to vote to the Israeli parliament because we are a democracy, we will lose our state overnight. They will be the majority. And therefore, the other option is to have a smaller Israel. That means that we are going to pull out for more land, give it to the Palestinians or anybody who wants to take it, because we are going to create a country which will be maybe smaller, indefendable borders, whatever that is in the modern era and warfare, with a solid Jewish majority. These are the two options. Because if you decide to annex the area without giving the people rights, that's apartheid. Israel is a democracy, and most people will value that as a very important thing. We don't want to give that up. And therefore, we are frustrated. We are a bit disappointed. It's a catch what to do. So the decision was to go with the smaller Israel, so to speak, and these were the outcomes of the elections about a year and a half ago. That's what the Israeli people wanted until the war in Lebanon, which really changed the whole mindset. Because the idea was, listen, if we will make another gesture and another one, maybe the other party will understand that we really want to close the deal here. But here is what Islam teaches. You cannot be, you're not permitted to be kind to the enemy. If you show kindness, it's weakness. That means we come from an approach and perspective of, let's say, the Western mindset. All right? Common sense. Let's talk See, maybe it works. The other party understands every initiation of a political process as a weak point invites more pressure. Why would they even offer to talk to us unless they're weak? And if they're weak, why stop now? Why did they leave the Gaza area? Well, because they suffered casualties, which is the right reason, at least one of them. So if by causing death on the Israeli side, they pulled back from Gaza, it's working. Why stop now? Let's face it, which is unpleasant. Terror is sometimes winning, not for the long range, but sometimes it's winning. And we see that all around the world. The question is how to stop that. And there are options, and we are learning. But we need to deal with those issues. Democracies do not know how to fight against terror, because the way to defeat terror is becoming one. And you do not want your army in Iraq to act like a bunch of terrorists. We don't want to do that either in Israel. But that's the way to do that, unless you develop the right weaponry and intelligence and even change some of even constitution sometimes, because it's a different type of warfare. Let's carry on. Another disappointing issue from one to the other, elections in the Palestinian side. Folks, democracy is a noble idea, no doubt. But have you thought about the possibility that not every country, not every people want to live in democracy? To speak about an Arab democracy, it's an oxymoron. There was no such thing. There was never such a thing. Because for the Muslim mindset, and that's what Islam teaches, you don't live in a democracy. You live in a theocracy, one nation, under one caliph. That's it. So you come with a great idea about emancipating people, give them rights. What if they don't want to be free? Have you ever considered that? Well, let's say that you bring the idea of democracy and you give them the right to vote. You cannot give people the right to vote and try to dictate the outcomes. The people vote. You might not like the outcomes. And that's what happened. There was a lot of pressure, by the way, by the U.S. on Israel to agree to the elections. We said it's not a good idea because it was evident that Hamas is going to win. But with the whole momentum to try to change the Middle East, and bring democratical ideas. That was the mindset, and that's what happened. So we should not be complaining. The people had spoken. The Palestinian people went to vote, and they voted Hamas. How disappointing, but it was a pure democratical process. And Hamas has a very clear agenda. It is true that people voted for them, you know, because the PLO was too corrupted, and they tried to change something in the regime, but they knew who they are voting for because the agenda of Hamas since 1988 is very clear. 
the total destruction of Israel. We don't recognize them. We don't talk to them. We don't negotiate. And now these are the leaders of the Palestinians. So what are we talking about? If the other side says loud and clear, we are not part of it. And they have, by the way, some right to say that. The reason is that when Israel made the agreement with the Palestinians, the partner was the PLO. Hamas was never part of the PLO. So Hamas says, officially, Israel signed an agreement with a regime which is no longer in power, and since we were never part of the PLO, we are not under any obligation to keep any of these agreements. Well, okay. At least we know what we're talking about now. You see, if there was still a question, who is willing to work for peace, now they say it loud and clear. It's not a secret anymore. We don't want peace. Israel doesn't have a right to exist. All the agreements that were signed are not good, never been good. It's Muslim land. We will not rest until. And we still try to kind of kid ourselves every now and then that maybe there is a way to work it out. Well, no, there was no way, unfortunately. Because now we speak about a totally different dimension. It's not in the hands of politicians anymore. So that's the situation at the moment. And as I told you, the whole world, by the way, agrees with Israel now. And once again, we are pleasantly surprised. You see, here's the problem. Three gentlemen over there. Mahmoud Abbas is the president of the PLO, or the Palestinian Autonomy. The man is with no control and absolutely nothing. I mean, nobody takes orders from Mahmoud Abbas, let alone the people in Gaza, which is today Hamas territory. The second one in the center, this is Ismail Haniyeh, elected prime minister of the Hamas, that the people in the West Bank do not recognize his authority. But the problem is that orders are given by number three, Khaled al-Mash'al from Damascus. That means this man is based in Damascus, sheltered, harbored, whatever, by the Syrian regime. We'll speak about Syria later on. And he's the one who gives the orders. Because he's the one who controls the weapons. So this man is the leader and has absolutely no power. This man is prime minister, and these two don't, didn't talk to each other for almost a year now. All right? This one is the official. He is the, the man in the front. But he's not in control. And the orders are coming from Damascus. So let's say that we want to talk to the Palestinians. Who exactly are we going to talk to? This one is not capable of delivering nothing. This one says, I'm not talking to them. And this one says, no, carry on terror. And these are the people that we're supposed to be partners with. So no wonder why there's so much frustration and no wonder why it's not working. So at the moment, the situation is, and by the way, this is Israel's position, but supported by the whole world. The EU and the US and everybody understands this is not working. In order to make it really bad, there was a civil war in the Palestinian side, and we were surprised to see the level of brutality. And by the way, they, the first, when it just started, they kicked out all the international media. We do not have footage about what was going on. What we do have was taken by cell phones of people who just happened to be in Gaza, including throwing people from the 15th floor to their death because it was PLO or Hamas. By the way, both Sunnis, so we don't speak about the problem within Islam. This is a conflict over power. Because if a Shiite kills a Sunni, well, there is some religious reason behind that. But in this case, except for the deep hatred between the two, one people, what a brutal civil war. So today, basically, what happens is that the territories are divided into two. We need to run this whole slide through, please, because I did cover that. As always, I'm not very disciplined with my slides. Thank you. Next one, please. Well, that's what happens. The PLO is controlling now the West Bank. Hamas is controlling Gaza. By the way, the West Bank has quite a lot of Hamas supporters as well. Nobody believed 15 years ago that Hamas, a small group, will ever be as powerful as to take over the whole area. It might happen here as well in 10, 15 years unless something will be done on their side, not ours. So right now we speak about people they don't have an independent country yet, but they do have two separated entities, and they hate each other's guts. And we're supposed to deal with the issue. Because if you talk to Abbas, he's representing maybe some people over here. But he's coming as the leader of those over here that don't accept his authority. So who are we going to talk to? And about what? Look at Gaza. That's how Gaza looks like. Do you see that? It looks like an amazing maze. Some people say, why don't you just go in and clear the area? You know what will it take? <laughs> it will take a very long time, lots of troops, and thousands of casualties. We might have to do that sooner or later. 
because we are sick and tired from the constant kind of flow of, of rockets and then rocketing the Israeli side. Because right now our retaliation is less than minor. We open the borders every now and then to let in caravans of food and pharmaceuticals. They want cash, by the way. Cash, currency, nobody in the world is willing to do that. Because this cash is going to buy more weapons and more ammunition, and therefore the world is offering help, but not cash money. And each time we open the border, and a caravan of trucks is at the entrance, there is an act of terror against those trucks. They are happy with the chaos. Because who is blamed for the chaos? Why are the people so miserable? And why are the people hungry sometimes? Because of Israel. That's how you bring up another generation on hatred. As simple as that. It's embarrassing how simple it is sometimes. And therefore, the situation at the moment, and we spoke about that as well, is the following. There was an Israeli soldier who was abducted by the Palestinians, and he's still somewhere in the Gaza area. We do not know the exact location, as small as Gaza is. But even if we had known, all they have to do is to do a little click on something to take his life. So once we move in, and that's the intent, to try to find his location, most likely that's going to be quite a failure. So we don't initiate any, any move toward this direction. But we are going in and out of Gaza whenever we have a reason. Israeli helicopters are patrolling the air over there. And whenever there is a good target, they launch a rocket. And we are experts to do that by now without too much collateral damage. And you are learning in Iraq as well. Because that's the way to do that. That's the only way to do that. So the situation at the moment is quite frustrating. And since nobody knows what to do, the solution is supposed to be another summit. Keep in mind that the one in 2000 had failed, kind of bitterly failed. And therefore, the outcome was a wave of terror. What happens now is that they try to initiate another one that will take place in November here in Washington, or there in Washington. And once again, two leaders are going to meet. Ehud Olmert is the Israeli Prime Minister, Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinians. The two leaders, loud and clear, the Israeli one included, are not authorized by the people to make any substantial steps towards each other. It's maybe the weakest government we ever had, but it's very solid. Because the members of the parliament in